Uh, hello, and welcome to another discussion in our Indigilet series where we read and discuss books by Indigenous authors. And today we will be discussing, oh, so it doesn't work when I blur my background. Uh, we're discussing Jasmine Ward's memoir, Men We Reaped. Um, so before we get into it, we should all introduce ourselves. My name is Marissa, and I work in the outreach department at the library. My name is Ariel Ojibwe, Ariel Ojibwe Indigenous. Uh, Boju, that's hello in Anishinaabemowin. Um, I am a member of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, and I am a big fan of young adult literature, but also nonfiction, uh, and also just stories that help us figure out our world and our place in it, um, and how we can move forward. And I think this book is a good example of that. I'm Elizabeth. I work at the library and the archives, and I'm super excited to talk about this book today. I'm Valerie, and I work in collections, um, specifically cataloging in the library, and this was an interesting book. I'm Christopher, and I'm in the youth department at the library. Hi, I'm Jackie. Uh, I work in the outreach department, and this is my first time joining this discussion, and I'm really excited to be here. Welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, okay, so Men We Reaped is a nonfiction book by Jasmine Ward, a two-time National Book Award winner, um, and MacArthur Fellow, too, maybe? Um, and it is a true story about a lot of historical weight and psychic weight and emotional and societal and and all sorts of weight of the history of this country bearing down on the lives of people in the deep Mississippi South and um, the five men whose lives are taken um, because of all of that history and weight. And they are people that Justin Ward loved. Um, and so for many reasons, this is a really hard book. <laughs> um, so I was thinking maybe we could start with why we wanted to read this book. You all are here voluntarily, I assume, <laughs> um, kind of. Um, so what drew you to reading this book? Um, and also if we could talk about something that resonated with us from the book and something that felt like so separate from our lives that we just learned a lot or felt a lot from. So I can start, but also Valerie, you're unmuted and you, <laughs> you, you said this. I am, because I don't have a clue how to oh, mute no. myself on this phone. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Um, so Jasmine talks a lot about being the firstborn daughter of a firstborn daughter. Um, and I'm also a firstborn daughter of a firstborn daughter. And my experience is nothing like hers. Um, you know, I wasn't expected to take care of younger siblings. I wasn't expected to help run a household. I was given all of these opportunities to concentrate on my schoolwork and I didn't have to work a job or um, help uh, run a household or um, um, you know worry about how food got on the table um, or or any of the other really deep responsibilities that come with um, motherhood, which is really what it seems like the firstborn daughter 
teams to be responsible for. Um, and that was this strange similarity that um, popped up throughout the book. And yet it couldn't be any more different for me, um, despite um, our birth order. Um, I think the motherhood is something and the parenting is something that I'd really like to come back to. But Christopher, haha, I noticed you unmuted. <laughs> well, I rarely have time or energy to read a book a second time, but this is the second time I've read this book. I just love it so much. Um, you know, and, and as far as well, what was complete? There are so many things that are very different about her life and my life. One thing that just stands out is I was never the only person in my school who uh, looked different from everyone else and was so noticeably different and identified that way. And she talks a lot about what it was like to go to school or her fear of someone finding out that she was wearing uh, their clothes as hand me downs. Um, there's one passage that really jumps out at me. It's very, very short, but I just feel like it encapsulates so much of this book. It's on page 162 for me. It's at the end of a chapter and she's thinking about her brother and she says, um, both of us on the cusp of adulthood, and this is how my brother and I understood what it meant to be a woman. Working, dour, full of worry. What it meant to be a man, resentful, angry, wanting life to be everything but what it was. And I think that uh, that pulls in so many feelings that I think she has about her parents and her family and her life uh, that, that she had experienced. Um, I thought this book was extremely well-written and I enjoyed reading it um, despite the difficult subject matter and feeling like throughout the whole time it's building up to this the stuff that you know is going to happen. And it was the first stuff that happened, but she tells it in reverse order. So it's kind of a weird experience reading it. Um, and I did relate to a lot of the stuff she said of like feeling weird at your school, but like, obviously it's not the same for me. I'm a white girl from the North who was around a bunch of other white girls. So like in some respects I can relate to her, but other respects I'm like, obviously I don't know that what that's like. Um, and it's really important to hear that from her mouth, from her words, and just think about the things that we'll never know, like in the North, like in a different culture, in a different family. I can't know what that was like, but um, just knowing that this history is still bearing down on people, like you said, and still having such an impact on people's lives. I was excited to read this because I had read one of her, her books, Salvage the Bones, which I really liked. Um, I really love her writing style. Um, and then Ariel and I had picked the titles. So Ariel had suggested this one, which was interesting because I didn't realize that she had any uh, Native American ancestry, which was very interesting. And I really loved how she explained all of her family history and who gave birth to who and like even I had to draw myself a family tree as she was going because I kept getting confused about who was who and how many children there were Um, because I've kind of gotten into some of my own family history. So it's like interesting how people carry those stories forward. Um, And so I really liked that. And um, yeah, like other people have said, there's certain pieces that I resonated Um certain things about just the experience of being a woman. Um, and then other things were just like super foreign that I can't even imagine what it's like 
um, and just really how easy my life has been. Um, of course, not to say like anyone's life is easy, but it certainly wasn't harder because of these things. Um, and like, I've lost family members, I'm sure everyone has and friends, um, but nowhere near the scope. And so like, even though she's talking about these five men who died towards the end of the book, she also mentions so many other family members and women who have died and just like the scale of loss is so different to what I've experienced, um, which is just astounding and incomprehensible really. And didn't her husband die? Yeah, I think, so the first time I read anything by Jasmine Ward, it was um, her piece in, for Vanity Fair about losing her husband. Um, I think we could probably just say to COVID, but it is it's like acute respiratory something um, in January of 2020. Um, and I didn't uh, know about her really, I don't think as an author, but I just read that piece and it was, uh, horrible and one wonderfully written. And, um, I read it again and, um, most of the way through halfway through, she's talking about, um, all the Black Lives Matter protests around the world um, and in the country um, and talking to her cousin and about the deaths. And she's like, didn't I, didn't I write about this? Don't we know about this? I, we've lived this and now we are living it again more publicly. Um, and um, I also read this book twice because it hit in such different ways and I wanted to read it in different ways. Um, and uh, something that I realized was that who knows, there could be different Brandons in her life. Um, but her husband who passed away is named Brandon. And after maybe Raja's death, she says her ex-boyfriend in high school pulled up and she is, she's talking to this ex-boyfriend named Brandon in high school. And that even that just really got me even more because there are so many deaths, but then to include that, like this one other person that like maybe could be pulled out of the story and, and, make his way through um also is torn from her in real life and and it's just part of i mean nobody knows why people why certain things happen with covid and everything but we do know about underlying health issues and systemic racist issues and so that one was a hard thing to add to this book. Ugh. Um, we also talked about gender, but maybe we could talk about something a little, <laughs> a little lighter for a moment. Uh, maybe the like family and how we carry family stories forward. Marissa, you were talking about, I love that you made a tree for them because yeah, when it was like my great, great grandmother over here and my just like on both sides, she knew everybody's story. And that was astounding and beautiful. And I could not even imagine actually growing up in a place where 
everybody knows your family going way back and you can ask people about both sides and you can walk on the places that they were walking and living and yeah did anybody feel that sense of family in place mostly i just uh not so much with her all of her past generations but just i i felt the complicated relationship she had with she had with her father and also with her mother you know her father seems to be such a good-natured easygoing fun parent with all of his shortcomings and meanwhile uh her mother is there with all the work a job and four children and it was exhausting to think about her life her mother's life um mm. it made me kind of angry <laughs> anybody else feel that way yeah, I kept there, like, whenever his, like, teenage girlfriend got brought up, I would have, like, a visceral reaction and be like, oh, like, why is he doing this? Um, yeah, so that was a bit rough. And then it would be like, oh, he had his seventh child since he left my mom. And I was just like, oh, okay. Um, yes. There's a lot going on. Um, and I do wonder, like, she doesn't really talk about any of her other siblings that were her half-siblings. So I'm like, what's going on there? Does she have relationships with these half-siblings? But it doesn't really expand upon that at all. But I was curious about that. And then, like, at, you know, like you said, like, the family is really embedded in this community. So she's, like, a lot of these men that she's talking about who have been killed or died are related to her in some way. But they're also her friends. So there's, like, this sense of community, friendship, and family that is like, runs very deep there. Um, was... On the things that make you mad note, um, dad starting the Kung Fu um, thing was just uh, like pushed me over the edge. Um, that was that was that was just a whole. I, yeah, I just had to mention that. Sorry, Marissa. That's OK. That also made me mad. So I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I was just also really curious about their half siblings. His their dad had six kids with four other women, and they do mention like playing with them at some point, or at least with some of them. Um, but they're never named, and not even to give them names felt strange. Um, and I, she writes so much about her mother, and I wondered if it was more of respect for her mom to not mention them as much. I I don't know. Um, and then it also just like has this astounding sense of place that I can't even imagine either of these multiple generations with big families intermarrying and friends who are second cousins or third cousins and even a problem of intermarriage being a problem when you're too closely related. Um, like I think it was CJ who dated, who was like a cousin, but also was dating her sister. Like mm -hmm. it just seems like that's how it and is. They were like, they were like, eh, it was kind of gross, but like, uh, it was sort of okay yeah. because everybody did does, does it. Yeah, yeah. They kind of they she glossed over it pretty quickly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I had been thinking about just like the sense of place that you get from having so many generations of people like all together on the same small town for so long. Where I guess I've just moved around a lot. My family's moved around a lot. I have family scattered to the winds and don't necessarily feel the same attachment to place um and it's just like it's another thing that's like completely unfathomable to me how that works and how that would feel and her just being so homesick constantly like it makes sense when it's such a part of like the place and the community i think that it seems like whenever they're talking about when she's home, especially when she talks about her youth, everybody's an, an auntie 
you know, and it's like they don't even bother to distinguish whether it's a blood relative or they just say auntie because it's more likely to be a blood relative than not, you know, um, that's just, that's just how it is. Um, yeah. I think it was interesting yeah, that, sorry. No, I, I just, I just can't imagine like growing up and leaving a place like that, especially when you're maybe one of the only ones of your generation who does like that makes it that much more difficult to leave, you know? Especially when she had such a hard time fitting in, it seemed like, like even making friends at college or making friends um, at her high school, like she was just in such a different, she was such a, from such a different place and such a unique place that even making friends seemed hard or like that they were still from different worlds. I think Not it's interesting that she tries to uh, move back there and get a job there and stay there with her family. But that doesn't work out because there's nothing there for her in her career path. And she could work a dead end service job, but that's like all that there is there. Well, even Not that she gets denied. She gets denied a, a Barnes and Noble job. I mean, she's now she's overeducated and under under experienced and she's going to get denied that. Sorry, Christopher. I was just going to say, not a big fan of Ann Arbor or Michigan. <laughs> like her assessments were correct. Like it's very cold and gray here in the winter. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, we were talking about Googling places and other books, and I definitely was Googling, Googling past Christian and Delisle and some other places and white sand beaches and those beautiful pine woods um crocodiles or alligators alligators I think it is <laughs> um that's a bit off-putting but yeah it's beautiful so you can see how that would sink in um I also think that it's interesting the the cousins, but the intermixing of everybody with the like sort of stark segregation, but sort of not like <clears throat> her great great grandfather. Okay, there are a lot of them, but one of them. Um, said she said he was like really very fair and that his children ranged from like vanilla to chocolate chip I think that she said um, <clears throat> and that that great great grand person's mother was also very fair and they would like they they lived in a place where they could be a mixed race family um, but then to go visit the mother's sister who like passed for white, essentially, they would throw a blanket over all the children and go drive up to this other part of Mississippi and like play, visit, be family. And then the great, great aunt would be like, okay, it's about time to go home. And the suggestion was like, the Ku Klux Klan is here and we don't want you by yourselves at night. And that's so much like people, all people are always mixing. People are always mixed. They just always are. And it's so strange to think of a place that is so physically segregated by races and so deeply familially entwined even like with their names and everything yeah it 
It is interesting that there's so many like places of origin for people. Like she had Native Americans and Haitians and African and Spanish and French people who all mixed together in their family line. And then they all just like people from all over the world. And then they all just stayed there through so many different like political things and history and yeah. And she mentioned a couple different Native Americans and like, you know, ha Haitian background being, I can't say, Taino, Taino um, is there too. Um, but her great, great person named Jeremy, who like owned the still and came from a nebulous like elsewhere, um, but like seemed to have a lot of money. Um, I was like, I wonder if he was part of the Trail of Tears or if when people got moved over from the Trail of Tears, um, if when the Osage and everybody they were bringing over to that area, if he was like, okay, well, I'm going to move on down to somewhere else or, or I was just wondering about that relocation and <clears throat> I um, looked up tribes of Mississippi and there's only one federally recognized tribe. It's the Choctaws of Mississippi. And um, there are no state recognized tribes that I that appeared with a quick search. And that is just something because from the 1500s to the 1800s, there were more than 20 tribes that were documented and people knew about. Um, and the Homas are in Louisiana and they um, are a group that people think took on a lot of other smaller groups, um, tribes, but they, they aren't listed at all as part of being over there. It's just one tribe. Okay. <laughs> Seems but yeah. like it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was fun hearing about where her people came from and how they met each other. There was a part that kind of struck me at kind of towards the end and she's visiting the house one of the houses where her mother works and she's sitting in the kitchen I think talking to the wife that owns the house and the woman is asking her what language are you studying and she's like I'm studying French and then she's kind of like oh that's so hard why would you do that Spanish is so much easier and she's like well my relatives spoke French Creole like <laughs> hello this is my heritage and it just struck me as so presumptuous that this white woman is like oh you're gonna learn French it's like so difficult um, like you don't, she doesn't know anything about her life or like where she comes from. So I thought that was really a good illustration of kind of like how people perceive her throughout her life. That's also where she talks about double consciousness. Um, um, let's see, what do my notes say here? Um, oh, she's living in two worlds. Her mom's like cleaning this white woman's house um, while this woman is talking to her like she's an intellectual equal. Um, and her mom's cleaning this white woman's house so that she can become this intellectual equal. Um, and uh, yeah, that part Okay, it really struck me, and I loved her description of it. Um, I have it all written down here, but I won't read it because you can read it yourself. Um, it, uh, <laughs> her, um, her description of that entire scene was um, yeah, that part. Favorite part, I think. I think that age is when she and her brother really start to live very divergent lives. 
um yeah and that around 14 um her brother is selling drugs and even much later when she comes home from college and someone's like clearly doing drugs she doesn't know what's going on um and somebody else explains it to her and um her brother also like takes charge when one of their family members is like totally passed out in a movie theater and they're just like kids but he pretty much like he's like yeah like I've got a plan I know what to do and it's where she starts seeing herself almost as younger she says basically that they do an inversion and he's the bigger brother and yeah what do you think about that or feel about that or about some of the forces in their lives that bring bring well them i think living with his father is a big factor in some of that change um i mean he was forced to fend for himself And the neighborhood itself was very much filled with people that were addicted to drugs and were wandering around. And she was commenting on that, like, why are all these people out here? And her dad tells her this is why. He's very blunt with her and tells her how it is. Mm -hmm. She Should seemed... We... Go no, you go ahead. <laughs> She seems very non-judgmental through the whole book, even though she's relaying the story of her father's kung fu school and how he ran out of gas and her mother's disdain and distance from her and her brother selling drugs. And uh, I think her brother stealing from Walmart and so many other things that she witnesses, even people uh buying and using crack cocaine she never seems to judge anybody to my recollection in the book and sometimes she comes right out and says this is what you get when you have no prospects no hope for doing anything interesting in your life when you're bouncing from one dead-end job to another uh, how do you blame people for for living like this um and i th i think it's such an important point i think it's easy to look at people who may be addicts or have other kinds of problems and feel different from them when in fact i think many of us would be in the same position if we had the same lack of prospects or hope that they might have Yeah, I did notice that. Um, I just had to check this book was written in 2013. And there is a part um, where they do mention uh, hydrocodone, I think, or like a prescription drug, which of course made me think about like the drug epidemic, which is really an epidemic of, of white people addicted to drugs, um, which has obviously been treated so differently from how like the crack epidemic was treated. Um, and yeah i had a lot of thoughts of like two groups of people having a similar behavior of feeling hopeless and turning to drugs but being treated extremely different by society for essentially the same choice it just really was so obvious and yeah, yeah even when the drunk driver who kills her brother gets five years like that 
that perfectly exemplifies it. It's like this white guy who had been the night before driving drunk and almost ran another person that they they know off the road. And then he gets like basically a slap on the wrist for this and he had to pay like $14,000. So it's like her brother's life is worth $14,000 in five years. But if it was a white kid that had been killed, I don't think that would have been the case. And he didn't end up even paying anything. And he only served, what, three years and two months or something like that. So worth even less in practice. One other aspect of the book that I really enjoyed so much is her her utter shock and disbelief at the people who have died and you know this is of course at the central part of the book she just can't fathom how people were here one day and now they are just gone somewhere and uh that really hit me hard in the book and it you know she refers to the wolf or something that seems to be just stalking her or her family or black men and yeah uh that was a really powerful part of the book for me i think she also does note that she is coping with with alcohol mostly and i think there is one section where she talks to her sister shireen and it, maybe she does i don't know if she says something judgmental but maybe she says that she said something judgmental <laughs> um and shireen is just like their adult, <laughs> this is their way of coping they have pain too and that's what they're doing and then she says it took her like a really long time to understand that she was doing the same thing and i wonder if like some of that um objectivity or lack of judgment or like understanding of the societal issues that are at play came because of writing the book or if she knew it but just didn't feel it like I just wonder how therapeutic and much of a learning process um, and to help this the writing of the book was and telling their stories. It must have been hard to write this book and to go back and talk to all the families and be live with so much pain and confusion and then have to edit your own stuff. I, thinking about that was tiring for me. Um, uh, you know, we get the final, very well worded book, and she had to write it the first time, and then edit it. Uh, that sounds awful to me. But like her sister felt like it was valuable enough to be saving her computer like from hurricane katrina and and many times men throughout the book but like demond in one specific instance is like hey you should write my story i have, I have a really great story and she's like yeah i'll think about it and like this is not what anyone meant but also it is a really important story and story that we don't we in white america in north america the northern part of north america 
<laughs> um, like, I don't hear very much. I don't hear about people in Mississippi very much at all. And definitely not um, stories from Black rural Mississippi. So I'm really grateful for this book, but it was really hard to read. And I'm sure, yeah, it was awfully painful to write. I just want to like think a little bit more about relocation of of peoples, um, her relocation throughout the story from her little tight knit community to the like suburb area and back again, and then out into the world to Stanford, to New York City, to Michigan. Um, and also her father's relocation um, and mother's to Oakland and LA. And I didn't realize that sort of like the great migration, a lot of people moved to Oakland um, during World War II because of factories and, and people looking for rural workers from the South um, and going specifically to Oakland, which I learned from my Angelou's book. Um, I just, after this book was like, whoa, I don't know. What do I do? What do I do now? So then I read, I know why the cage bird sings. And I was like, wow, there's way too much overlap for these women to be so far apart in time. Um, but it's fascinating. Um, and yeah. And the relocation of her Haitian and her Creole and her native and, and her black ancestors. Um, let's talk about it. <laughs> what does it mean? And like, her dad bringing the bringing the kung fu from Oakland, the the Black Panther vision of community to his New Orleans, his New Orleans neighborhood. Yeah. I wondered if she went to school in Stanford, kind of following her father's footsteps a little bit. You know, I, I don't know, but I I just wondered because she, for all of his faults, she seemed to really look up to him and admire him a lot. And I wondered if that figured in her choice to move to California the way he had. It almost seems like the movements that they make are kind of out of necessity, like they are chasing something else. Um, I don't remember. I think sh her father moved there because he was like, wanted to be artistic and wanted to like experience something else. Um, but then they all end up coming back. And like you said, like bringing this, the experiences that they had, like he brought the Black Panther stuff, he brought the, um, the Black Belt and he was like, ready to teach this to people but like did that actually help anything <laughs> did he learn anything mostly with the black panther stuff i was struck at how all these radical ideas and justice and you know expanding your mind and self-educating and all of that but it really only extended to men and he still treated women so poorly I thought the same thing. He was thinking about his community and and self-empowerment. And then he treats his own family so poorly and his wife so poorly. And there seemed to be a real lack of uh, self-awareness in some ways with him. And I guess like the brutality of masculinity where he thinks he's doing his son a kindness by really just making him fend for himself and 
sleep on the couch with cockroaches and but to us Or, it sounds so horrible <laughs> yeah, or beating him when he would leave Jasmine alone. When he was in Oakland and she mentions like his offer of a scholarship for art, it just is like, wow, how different everything might have been. And yet like he gave that up then to take care of his mom and his siblings. And it just seems like, What a confused choice that is the one time maybe you should have been selfish um, and it could have led to such different things for the family. And I, yeah, he's, he's a schmuck, but also <laughs> I feel like he, I mean, he's trying. Sometimes he's there. I did not have a dad that was there ever. And sometimes some parents don't need to be there at all. And he did a bad job, but <laughs> he also brought light to his kids' lives sometimes. And he was showing up and trying. And I also feel like Jasmine did a good job of being um, trying to be objective about like, like you said, Christopher, her like clear adoration of him. Um, and, and also she shows how much it means um when he abandons them and Mm -hmm. what that means for her self-respect and ability to love herself and see herself as a valued person um and then i feel like that adds to her self-awakening of societal abandonment of of black people um and poor people and people in the rural south and i mean she talks about reagan economics and um like the the ripping away of support systems that were in place coupled with rampant excess in business i don't know what's going on with the business world but like just the total shift in economy to a service model. Um, well, I don't know. I just, I'm spinning out of control here, but. <laughs> there's so uh, much in the book. Yeah, like, there's so, so many much. <laughs> I love the scene that she describes where the family is eating popcorn and watching VHS tapes and she talks about how it's the only way that they can afford to entertain four kids for a weekend, um, which was something that I could resonate with as, you know, something that I grew up with. Um, and, you know, something my the only way my family could afford to entertain us. Um, probably had the same popcorn machine. And... Um, but then she goes right into, you know, how they were ignorant of their mother and father's dissatisfaction and then right into just, yeah, the ripping apart of their marriage and, you know, everything falling apart immediately afterwards. And like you said, the, the effect it has on her and sort of her. her view of society and trust and, you know, just the, the massive far reaching effects of it. Um, 
Yeah. It really is amazing that she so masterfully illustrates all of these societal problems with her own family in only like 250 pages, but she touches on so many things and does so like with kindness. Like it seems like her and her mother did not always have the best relationship and her and her father was complicated and people's lack of trust in different relationships. Like maybe people weren't the best they could have been, but because of all of these other things, it it seemed to explain a lot of things, but without excusing poor behavior and to be so heavy and sad, but also like show some really beautiful moments as a kid and running around and having fun outside and just to all be done in 250 pages is really impressive, honestly. There were some really touching scenes of her childhood, touching and happy, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, running around outside and the popcorn scene where they, in my mind, they're they're all kind of cozy, snuggling up together to watch this movie, you know, and she some talks about their faces being covered in butter. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the the sense of um watchfulness that they had for each other at times because their parents were so busy and preoccupied or not there or working or whatever they really had to fend for themselves you know it was but it was also hard thinking of jasmine being this little girl responsible for three other kids and losing the house key or you know and she's she's so self-aware that same scene she talks about uh knowingly berating her sister to go pee in the bushes and because she knows she's got to get through this moment so she berates her sister and they get through it and then she says no that wasn't so bad was it man it's a it's a lot of weight to put on a little kid mm-hmm have that responsibility uh, geez <clears throat> or there's that scene that she describes early in the book where her brother wants to follow her and she wants to play with a cousin i think and yeah. her brother gets a beating for wailing outside the window i think her her father hears him and he, and she like carries that weight like through till her like now I mean, I think it's really early in the book that she talks about it and, you know, the guilt that she carries for that. Um, and she was, what, like four? You know, I think it, it yeah. That's but that's kind of the oldest daughter, oldest daughter of an oldest daughter sort of a thing. Maybe the oldest daughter of an oldest daughter sort of thing. And what you just said, Christopher, about like the self-knowledge while berating the younger sibling, I never really thought of, so that's a sibling thing, but like, I never thought of how um, a single mom overwhelmed and just giving a kid's thinking or like, yelling at them or like slamming them in their room or something must feel mm -hmm. similarly like I know I can and should be doing better but I can't actually because I'm at the end of my rope because I am working three jobs and have to feed them and I'm exhausted and et cetera et cetera et cetera like yeah like, not only do you really feel for her mom situation, but man, what you just said, like, adds the, like, self-knowledge to that. And I, f I feel like that pulled apart 
Jasmine and her mother, because when Jasmine's going through the like self loathing, her mom, her mom blames herself. And she's like, you must be mad at me for bringing this on the family. And so gets mad at her. And then they're just like more at loggerheads. And that hurts so much. But I think, I think sometimes there, there are overlaps in the points of pain um, and the points of joy. Like 13 people living in one house. <laughs> she says that it was really wonderful for her and her cousins, um, but that she like recognizes that it must have been awful for the adults <laughs> and I uh, and and they're just there are interesting points that are beautiful like that like the year that she she was like yeah I got a rope for my birthday great but I also loved it <laughs> I loved it and I climbed up and I had so much fun for so many hours yeah I think it really helps you understand how that place keeps drawing her home despite all of its pain. Okay. There are lots more things we could say, but unless anybody wants wants to say any particular thing, I think we covered a lot. Oh, yes, Jackie? <laughs> the only other thing I had a note about was just to comment on the playground that was going to become the burial ground. And that that just kind of wasn't a bit of a I don't have an I don't have a appropriate response to that other than oh my god um so yeah if anybody else has something intellectual to say about that um, but I just had. Playground becoming burial ground, exclamation point. Yeah, I thought that stood up too. It's like, where will they play though when that happens? Mm. Yeah. Like, how long will it take? Are we moving beyond? Is it, like... is it just like an immediate like transition? over or like how does that work i don't know but just the whole thing just that was my last comment i mean i have a non sequitur response which is that uh and watching a one of the interviews with justin ward i learned that uh mississippi officially ratified the 13th amendment in 2013 so there's that. Um, and they didn't remove the Confederate battle album uh, emblem from their state until 2020. And hmm. I think those are additional good indicators of the weight that she keeps on talking about feeling in her beloved state mm -hmm. so exclamation point after those as well
yeah, I just think it kind of goes with the like the Demond being a good dad and trying to do the right things and being shot in the yard on his way home and and her brother's murderer essentially doing nothing like there's just no accountability for an, any of the pain that's been happening forever I feel like is a really big message of this book that wraps into our playground is just being subsumed by a graveyard Mm -hmm. thanks for reminding us of that image and thanks for talking about this book everyone even though it was really hard and thanks for reading it thanks for choosing it Mm -hmm. and for facilitating this <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time <laughs>